Next item of business is a debate on motion 7774 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the contract third party rights Scotland bill at stage three. Before the debate begins, the presiding officer is required understanding orders to decide whether in his view any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members. That is a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that no provision of the contract third party rights Scotland bill relates to protected subject subject matter, therefore the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. I'm sure we're all relieved. Um, I now call Annabel Ewing to speak to and move the motion, please. Ms Ewing, seven minutes or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like at uh, the start to refer members to my uh, entry in the Register of Interest, where they will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I do hold a practising certificate, but I'm not currently practising. It gives me, presiding officer, great pleasure to open this stage three debate on the contract third party rights Scotland bill and to invite members to agree to pass the bill this afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their hard work and careful scrutiny of what is essentially a narrow and specialist bill. Uh, they have been a great credit to the parliament. I would like to thank uh, MSPs uh, across the Chamber for their comments on the bill during its passage through the Parliament and also to thank the organisations and individuals who provided oral and written evidence to the committee. I am also very grateful to the clerks, uh, to the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their support. And in particular, I would like to pay special thanks to the Faculty of Advocates who have been generous in giving of their time and expertise as we have developed the legislative proposals in relation to arbitration. Uh, and I also would thank all witnesses who, witnesses who have supported the process and highlighted, as we have gone through, helpful improvements to the bill. And last but not least, presiding officer, I wish to, to place on record my thanks once again to the Scottish Law Commission. As always, the Commission's advice and views have been invaluable. As I indicated during the stage one debate, the bill has its origins in the Scottish Law Commission's review of contract law report on third party rights. And this was published in July 2016. This is now the third bill to be considered as part of the SLC bill procedure. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to record my view that the process that is in place to scrutinize these bills continues to work very effectively. And it is clear that we can continue to have confidence in that process as we go forward. I said that the bill was essentially of a specialist nature and it is, but it became clear through the scrutiny process that its provisions have the potential to impact on any one of us who may find ourselves the third party to a contract. Ensuring that the bill fulfills the policy aims of making the law fairer, clearer and more consistent is therefore very important. As we heard, these are after all the first significant developments to the law in this area in nearly 100 years. The contract third party rights Scotland bill has been widely welcomed by the legal profession and also other professions such as members of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland, recognising as they did the potential usefulness of the provisions for construction law. The concept of third party rights in Scots law termed use causation tertium, I know that uh, colleagues have become experts in this, uh, in this phrase as we have gone through the various debates, uh, but this phrase used causation tertia dates back to the 17th century and that term is still used today. It has the literal meaning of right acquired by a third party. For a third party right to be in existence, the current law requires that the contracting parties intended to benefit the third party and that the right must be constituted irrevocably. However, this common law doctrine is rarely used in Scotland and has been the subject of some criticism on the basis that it is inflexible and does not meet modern standards. The law has also been criticised as being unclear with Lord Reid of the UK Supreme Court remarking that there is a need for commercial parties to have, and I quote, clear rules in relation to third party rights under contract. The absence of confidence in the law as it stands among Scots law practitioners means that English law is sometimes chosen in place of Scots law to govern transactions that are otherwise Scottish in nature. The current uncertainty over third party rights and lack of flexibility therefore damages the reputation of Scots law by limiting its use. The law as it stands is simply not working well for most people, if at all. 
And we are aware that workarounds such as, as resorting to English law or the use of collateral warranties have been adopted to compensate for the law not being fit for purpose. But these workarounds can bring their own difficulties and issues. A clear, positive and readily accessible statement of the law in a short statute will improve the standing and value of Scots law domestically and internationally, given the multi-jurisdictional nature of many of the transactions in which contracts are created. The bill therefore abolishes the existing common law rule and establishes a statutory basis for the operation of third party rights in Scotland. Most importantly, the bill addresses the issue of irrevocability. For a third party right to be in existence, the current law, as I said, requires that the right must be irrevocable. So when the contract is formed, assuming that the criteria for the creation of a use acquisition tertiary are met, uh, the contracting parties are unable to withdraw or change the third party right. But this is at odds with the freedom of the contracting parties themselves to modify, cancel or otherwise amend the terms of the contract. Much of what is contained in the bill is intended to be the default position. It remains open to the contracting parties to define exactly what they intend to happen. Overall, I believe that the bill strikes the right balance by providing an effective legal framework for third party rights, which does not cut across party autonomy. I am pleased that this is a view that was shared by a number of the witnesses. As the Scottish Law Commission points out in its business regulatory impact assessment, and I quote, the bill is general in its application and not confined to any particular sector uh, or group. A wide range of sectors will potentially be able to make use of it. Presiding officer, voting for the contract third party rights Scotland bill today will ensure that an important area of the law is subject to long overdue reform. It is an area which could impact on any one of us at any time should we find ourselves as third parties to a contract. For that reason, it is therefore important that the law meets expectations and is fit for purpose. And I believe that these reforms will achieve that aim. I move, presiding officer, that the parliament agrees that the contract third party rights Scotland bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Before I call Graeme Simpson, can I ask all members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call Graeme Simpson. Mr Simpson, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before I start, I want to pay tribute to the work of my colleague, John Scott, who was convener of the current uh, DPLR committee from the start of this session and a member of its predecessor committee. Uh, he can take a considerable amount of credit for the smooth and constructive, yet careful and rigorous way this bill has been scrutinised. Uh, so thank you to John Scott and the committee. I've had a lot of catching up to do on contract law and third party rights. It wasn't something we talked about much in my previous job as a Scottish Sun journalist, nor is it the big talking point on the number 31 bus in East Kilbride, but it is an important bill. As I've said, this has been a constructive process. John Scott said in the stage one debate that this is the third Scottish Law Commission bill to be scrutinised by the Parliament. The Scottish Law Commission bill process itself is a relatively new one which was created in order to improve the implementation rate of Scottish Law Commission reports. Put simply, the process is there to update, simplify and improve the law in Scotland. As parliamentarians, lawmakers and representatives of the people, that is something we welcome. This bill follows the Commission's report on third party rights, which was published in July 2016, as part of its review of contract law. I wish to thank the Scottish Law Commission, and in particular Professor Hector McQueen, for the constructive and helpful way they engaged with the Parliament at all points in the process. The bill proposes changes to the law in Scotland, which allows parties to a contract to create rights for third parties. The main aim of the bill is to make the law clearer and more usable in this area. Now, some may find the bill quite dry, technical, and ever so slightly dull. I might even have fallen into that trap, but that would be to miss the point. This is a bill that provides clarity in law, not just for politicians, QCs, and judges, but for ordinary men and women in everyday situations in all of our constituencies. It means that, for example, if a family holiday goes wrong, family members who didn't book the break themselves but still suffered the holiday from hell can enforce their rights under statute. 
It means that under statute, an informal carer can enter a contract to get building work done on behalf of a client who suffers from dementia and lacks the capacity to make that contract. And it means a subcontractor running a small business and struggling to pay their bills now has the statutory right to claim payment from the contractor who signed the original contract. Real people, everyday situations, ensuring fairness and equity. I've already said it's been a constructive process. The Scottish Law Commission has engaged with the Parliament from the start and will doubtless do so again. I also want to thank the Scottish Government and in particular the Minister Annabel Ewing for listening to the DPLR committee and responding to the will of the Parliament. The Government's stage two amendments responded to concerns of witnesses such as the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society and others and the recommendations of the committee's stage one report. They cleared up any semblance of doubt over the enforcement of the right in relation to the issue of arbitration. And they removed possible unintended consequences of application of existing third party rights under the common law of just quaesetum tertio or something like that after the provisions of the bill are commenced. These amendments ensured that what will emerge following the parliamentary process is even clearer than the bill as introduced. So I thank the Minister and her officials for that constructive, democratic and thoughtful approach. On 5th of September, the First Minister announced that in this year's programme for government, there would be a prescription bill, which the DPLR committee expects to scrutinise. I look forward to scrutinising that bill. I look forward to engaging constructively with the Scottish Law Commission. Indeed, I look forward to holding the Scottish Government to account as we work together to improve Scots law, ensuring it remains relevant and competitive alongside other legal systems. And perhaps, most importantly, I look forward to hearing and championing the views of those affected by the legislation, from advocate to artist, solicitor to student, professor to punter. US Supreme Court Judge Louis Brandes once said, if we desire respect for the law, we must first make the law respectable. The work of the Scottish Law Commission in seeking to update and improve Scots law to make it relevant and competitive is to be commended, and I thank it for its work on this bill. I support the motion in the name of the Minister that the contract third party rights Scotland bill be passed. And thank you, Mr. Simpson. As you're surrounded by advocates, I don't think they're finding this the least bit dry. Um, I call Claire Baker, please. Ms. Baker, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. So this afternoon, we finalised the passage of the contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. For those of us who contributed to the Stage 1 debate, I imagine much of the discussion will be fairly familiar. This is not the most debated, controversial or wide-ranging piece of legislation we have considered, but that does not diminish its value. I would like to thank the Scottish Law Commission for their work on the bill. They play a significant role in ensuring that our laws are relevant, accessible and consistent. For over 50 years, they have worked to recommend laws to improve, simplify and update the law of Scotland. In the past 20 years, the Scottish Parliament has given greater opportunity for taking forward their work. And there have been some high profile, even contentious pieces of legislation originating from them. This includes the abolition of feudal tenure, which took considerably longer than this piece of legislation to pass, and the protection of the rights and interests of adults who are incapable of managing their own affairs. The bill today, however, has passed with a degree of consensus. Such was the consensus, I note that at stage two, MSPs were entirely content with the Minister's amendments. Um, I would like to thank the committee members for their work on the bill and all the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee. The expansion of the role of the Delegated Powers Committee to include law reform is proving to be effective. We owe a debt of gratitude to the many witnesses who gave us their time and expertise to support the legislative process and the work of this Parliament. Indeed, the witnesses to this piece of legislation provided effective reasoning to the committee who highlighted these issues in the Stage 1 report. Their input has been invaluable. The discussion at stage one persuaded the minister to bring forward a number of amendments at stage two, including those to provide greater clarity to section nine and its relationship with section one, following discussions from the Faculty of Advocates. 
In moving the amendment, the Minister did say that a number of points raised by the Faculty go beyond the third party rights into possible wider changes into the laws of arbitration and that she did not consider the bill to be the right vehicle for addressing all the points that were raised by the Faculty of Advocates. Could the Minister possibly reflect in closing the merits of these points from the Faculty and whether the Government intends to pursue a different route to addressing them? The Minister also recognised the arguments from the Law Society of Scotland that Section 10 is superfluous and introduced amendments to address this, as well as making amendment to Sections 12 and Section 13. Amendments agreed indicate there was a desire to deliver a bill which is clear, efficient and readily understood. And, presiding officer, the bill we are intending to pass today, originating from the important work of the Law Commission, um, has received considerable scrutiny from the Parliament, as well as valuable insight and improvement suggestions made from other interested parties. And it will provide a new statutory framework with clearer rules on third party rights and provide later clarity within Scots law. However, there is the recognition that the Act is unlikely to be widely adopted any time soon and that, partic partic sorry, and that practitioners will continue to use the established workabouts or continue to use English law. Although there is substantive evidence in supporting the introduction of the bill, it is likely to be limited in its use, with a preference for the familiar and a tendency towards caution to be anticipated. In time, however, if the benefits of the legislation are to be made clear, this may encourage legal practitioners and their clients to use the Act, particularly in the pursuit of flexibility and providing an additional tool to be used alongside existing alternatives. So in closing, can I ask uh, the Minister what role the Scottish Government sees for itself and other partners to promote the potential benefits of the legislation? I believe that by raising awareness of the legislation and the opportunities that it presents, this could increase the application of the law, which would then lead to increased confidence and familiarity. I hope the government will consider the merits of taking this forward once we conclude the business of this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Open debate. Speeches are four minutes. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Alison Harris. Ms. Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I believe anything that demystifies the legal process so that it's better understood by the layperson and improves access to justice can only be good. That's why I'm happy to support stage three of the contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill, which replaces the current law, which is causing a great deal of uncertainty and confusion. The lead committee, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, took evidence from a wide variety of stakeholders who welcomed the reform, which I suppose could come into the category of a common sense improvement. The Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland say it will clear up areas of ambiguity and doubt. The Law Society of Scotland states the law on this issue is outdated compared to the approach of other modern legal systems. The general aim of the bill is to provide a new statutory framework with clearer, more usable rules on third party rights. The changes proposed are based on the recommendations made by the Scottish Law Commission, which found that the existing law is no longer fit for purpose, or to put another way, is long past its sell-by date. Under the current law, it's not clear whether third parties have a right to claim damages for breach of a third party right. So as I understand it, it strengthens the rights of the third party. Examples of where these rights might apply could be insurance contracts, company contracts, construction contracts, and of course pensions, where an employer's pension scheme might allow a third party to be nominated as the beneficiary if the employee dies while still in employment. Time limits for bringing claims under the current law are also very unclear. The general rule is that most claims can no longer be made five years after the day in which loss, injury or damage first occurred. However, the Prescription and Limitations Scotland Act 1973 doesn't even mention third party rights. Under Scots law, third party rights have to be irrevocable, but that, there is uncertainty as to what this actually means and the SLC believes, believes the need for irrevocability is one of the main problems with the current law. The bill also includes rules which mean that third party rights to arbitrate could be created. Put simply, the rule of irrevocability is too inflexible and is one of the main problems with the current law, which in itself would be cause for a new statutory framework. In England, Wales and some other countries, the law enables third party disputes under certain circumstances to be dealt with by arbitration. However, Scottish arbitration legislation under the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 does not expressly deal with third party rights and this bill would correct that. 
In conclusion, let me end with the good news that the bill is not expected to result in any new costs and there is an argument that it could in fact provide savings to businesses and to the legal profession. Presiding officer, I stated at the outset that I applaud anything which brings, brings clarification to legal matters and which enhances access to justice. And for that reason, I'm happy to recommend the contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill to the Chamber today. I call Alison Harris to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to see further progress in the passage of this bill and welcome the opportunity to take part in this Stage 3 debate this afternoon. I have been involved in the scrutiny of the bill in my role as a member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I have enjoyed the process and over the months my initial views that this was a measure worthy of support have never wavered. Since I spoke in the Stage 1 debate back in May, further amendments have been made, making the bill even more fit for purpose. These amendments included the tightening of language used to ensure that the provisions of the bill were readily understood and other measures which were unanimously agreed to by the committee. As a committee, we heard compelling evidence from bodies such as the Scottish Law Commission that the existing law really needed to be updated. This was brought home when, during discussion on the bill, reference was made to case law going back to Wood versus Moncur in 1591. <laughs> case law in the centuries since only added to the difficulties of interpretation, flexibility and clarity to such an extent that the Law Society of Scotland have said that many lawyers were not comfortable with giving advice in an area of the law which was so unclear. In modern day commercial activity, the law clearly was not working. Many groups were choosing to enter into contracts under more flexible terms set out under the revised law in England and Wales. A law that since 1999 has been in sharp contrast to the irrevocable nature of the law here in Scotland. The need for irrevocability in the law as it presently stands is one of its main problems and has led to significant barriers to the use of third party rights as it restricts the freedom of the contracting parties. Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope that another of the pleasing effects of this bill will be a return of the parties, happy once more to use the law of Scotland in settling disputes and seeking remedy. Reform will not only remove concerns that limit the usage of the Scots law in commercial transactions, but it will keep Scots law fit for purpose for modern day usage. In this bill that brings much needed clarity to the law, it will remove many of the barriers and address many of the concerns that the Scots Law Commission and others have told us about. The bill will not only assist, the business, assist business, it will also be of great benefit to the individual, whether booking a family holiday or a third party beneficiary of a life insurance policy. Further, it clarifies that a third party could be entitled to a remedy to which a contracting party would be entitled and removes any doubt as to whether third parties have the right to claim damages. It will bring the law more in line, not only with our neighbours in England and Wales, but also friends across the Commonwealth, such as Singapore, New Zealand and several Australian states, who in recent years have moved away from positions similar to what was currently the law here in Scotland. In conclusion, can I thank all my colleagues in the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, the then convener John Scott and latterly Graeme Simpson, ministers, parliamentary staff and all those from outside the parliament who have assisted us with our roles on the committee. Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill gives us the opportunities that I have mentioned, clarity, flexibility and restoring confidence that in this area, Scots law is amongst the most up to date in the world. It will be of great benefit to both business and individuals. I am delighted to continue my support for this bill this afternoon. Thank you. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to follow Alison Harris as another member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And as you've heard, we've been the lead committee on this bill over the past several months and it's fair to say we've become fairly well acquainted with the arguments for why this change in the law is necessary. As I previously set out in my contribution to the stage one debate on the bill, the evidence has been very clear amongst those we received submissions from, including the Law Society of Scotland, Scottish Law Commission and Faculty of Advocates, that the current common law arrangements are not sufficient and that clarification was required. As other colleagues have mentioned, 
It's welcome that there is so much agreement on the content of the bill, and I suppose the largely uncontroversial nature of it also undoubtedly means that we're all going to be repeating the same points throughout this uh, short debate. And when I look back at the official report for stage one, I was struck by Murdo Fraser's comments, who I don't think is in the chamber with us today. And I suppose to paraphrase Murdo Fraser, he was um, rhyming all the, all the challenges we have as, as MSPs. And uh, I think he was finding it, um, despite his own legal background, quite challenging to construct a, a sort of lengthy speech. I'm not sure if that's because of the dry technical nature or because we all agree so much on the merits of the bill. So I would like to associate myself with the sentiment of consensus and uh, thank all of the witnesses who gave us their expert advice over several uh, committee sessions and of course to the clerks for their support throughout that process and I would echo Graham Simpson's remarks and his tribute to, to John Scott who uh, we already missed from the committee but I'm sure that, that Graham Simpson will be a very able replacement and already um, learning about our new convener and the fact that he spends time on the number 31 bus in East Bride, which presiding officer might be uh, um, fun for you to hear as well. <laughs> Witnesses have told us that codifying and updating the existing law on third party rights will provide clarity, flexibility and revocable rights which will promote the use of Scots law and that was an important point I think for all of us on the committee. Um, Ross Anderson from the, the faculty highlighted that the, the bill might benefit people who don't really have access to um, expensive legal advice. Um, and he said that one of the great advantages of the bill is that it sets out in modern language what the law actually is, an important point. Um, I do pay tribute to the Scottish Law Commission for being a leader on this issue and proposing these changes to Parliament. Whilst the changes on this issue may appear to be largely technical and not on the face of it mainstream or pressing issues to many people, the issue of third party rights is an important one and this change will make a difference to many, a point the Minister uh, made in her opening remarks. And as Rona uh, Mackay set out from insurance contracts, construction contracts and indeed pensions, um, this is something that could benefit many people. I'd like to pick up on one point arising from the committee sessions in regards to the enforcement of the law in the future. It has been said that this bill will promote the use of Scots law, but whilst there has been widespread support for the bill, witnesses have suggested that they did not expect the bill's provisions to be adopted straight away. I do hope we see this bill enforced and adopted in Scotland and that the Law Commission, the Law Society of Scotland and others can play their part in raising awareness of these changes amongst their members to ensure that those who do need the provisions of the bill are able to make good use of it. I'm no legal expert, but the evidence the committee has heard has clearly highlighted to me that the codifying of third party contract rights will be important to improving the use and reputation of Scots law. I welcome the bill as amended. At the last of the open debate contributions, this is Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, Sitting Officer. First of all, I'd want to put on record my thanks to the former convener, uh, John Scott, uh, and his chairing of the DPLR committee, and in particular, uh, this bill as it progressed through the committee. John was a fine convener, and I'm sure Graeme Simpson will be likewise and wishing well in his new role. Uh, it can be a challenge actually taking part in the scrutiny of a bill uh, at the end of its progress, but I think Graeme Simpson's uh, contribution uh, earlier on today's uh, was, uh, was excellent and, uh, and I thank him for that. As was highlighted today and also in the stage one debate, uh, this bill isn't contentious as, as we can uh, gather by the contributions from uh, around the chamber, uh, and, uh, and, but it is providing an opportunity to codify and modernise common law on third party rights. It's been stated bef during, the pa during the passage of the bill that the current law uh, has actually caused some concern and confusion, uh, but this bill uh, from the Scottish Law Commission will actually rectify that and it certainly has been welcomed by stakeholders. It's the third such bill from the SLC and it's the first time in this parliamentary session and uh, I was on the DPLR committee in the last session of parliament when we scrutinised a similar piece of legislation that was the, the legal writings counterparts and delivery uh, Scotland bill. At the time uh, I thought that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee was a useful avenue uh, for parliament to actually possess uh, to deal with law reform and I'm genuinely delighted that the committee now 
actually has the power and the responsibility to look at law reform as it's uh, been able to assist uh, with the, the wider issue of law reform in Scotland. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has certainly been supportive of the bill as uh, those who have provided evidence uh, have suggested that paragraphs 27 and 40 of our stage one uh, report uh, certainly touched upon the speed of law reform and also the introduction of the bill. Uh, as others have uh, stated before, and uh, as the evidence also shows, there wasn't much concern about that. But I, I want to reiterate one point that uh, I made earlier in the committee, but also during the stage one debate. And I know that the minister stated that uh, she was going to raise uh, this issue with uh, Lord Penfold uh, when they next met, and that was the issue of uh, bundling, and I'm quoting the minister uh, there, that, uh, that was from the stage one debate. Uh, the Scottish, well, the SLC proposals uh, are on a smaller focus legislative improvements and, and I asked the Minister whether that she and the Scottish Government along with the SLC would actually consider whether further SLC bills could actually be incorporated uh, to include uh, more than one bill uh, and uh, I certainly am pleased that the Minister provided a commitment to, to actually explore the issue in the future. A lot of reform doesn't take place regularly uh, or in a vacuum and uh, as this bill and also the area that it covers highlights if it is possible to actually improve and update the law by more SLC bills uh, covering multiple areas or being bundled together, then I think we could actually make even more headway with law reform going forward. However, we are not alone, uh, as the, this bill highlights, and uh, similar legislation was first muted uh, in Westminster in 1937, uh, with a bill actually being presented to the UK Parliament in 1999. In the bill uh, that we're discussing today, that the codification of the law of third party rights provides certainty for users of Scots law, which our report in stage one actually highlighted in paragraphs 51 to 61. Law firms it will be able to use that certainty in legislation instead of using expensive collateral warranties or law from other jurisdictions. Murdo Fraser during the stage one uh, debate uh, touched on the area of collateral warranties, which uh, was also touched upon as we went through the evidence. The collateral warranties can be expensive and there was a hint that uh, some organisations might still prefer to use them because of the revenue that they can actually generate for those firms. But this, in this bill, uh, that's in front of us today, will actually help us deal with that issue of Scots law. In our case, it will actually ensure that cases that do not use English law can actually use Scots law. Witnesses were clear that uh, there will be, uh, won't be a rush to use the new legislation because training will certainly be required once the bill has been enacted. Nonetheless, it will in time be used for a greater number of contracts and that can only be of economic benefit for Scotland. In conclusion, presiding officer, this bill, although short, with 15 sections, it clearly was well written as there were only seven amendments uh, proposed which were passed unanimously at stage two in committee. I would like to echo the comments of others uh, by thanking the SLC, the Scottish Government, everyone in the DPLR team uh, and witnesses for their efforts in bringing the bill to a successful conclusion tonight at decision time. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Mary Fee. Four minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing for Scottish Labour today, I want to begin by once again thanking the Scottish Law Commission for undertaking the work that has resulted in the contracts Third Party Rights Scotland Bill that we are debating today at Stage 3. And ensuring that our legal system is fair, balanced and just, we must listen to those who work daily in their legal fields. And that's the approach Parliament has taken with this piece of legislation. And I'd also like to thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their informative Stage 1 report that gave us a crucial insight into why we need to make this small yet crucial legal change. And speeches from across the Chamber today have been supportive of both the principle behind the bill and the need to make the change. And in the short time I have to close, it's difficult for me to reflect on all of the contributions, but I would like to say that I'm grateful for the consensual and constructive way that, that colleagues have approached this debate, and that has been reflected in the contributions today. And as we know, the bill has support from across the legal profession and has been backed by a range of stakeholders. And the general principles of the bill allow us to ensure legal certainty, flexibility and fairness in advancing third party rights. And replacing the existing common law with a statutory version will end the reliance of the ad hoc development of case law. 
And ensuring this legal certainty should also allow those entering into a contract to use Scots law and not laws from other jurisdiction, jurisdictions. And the policy memorandum informs us that the bill will promote the use of Scots law. However, witnesses speaking to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee raised a note of concern that the bill's provisions may not be adopted by legal professions following the bill's assent to an act. And witnesses indicated that some legal practitioners and clients may continue to use the familiar practices such as collateral warranties and English law. And I believe this is something we will have to be mindful of in the coming years to ensure the ambitions of this bill are met. And, and scrutiny, I think, will be of key importance as this legislation moves forward. Third party rights must become more flexible, adaptable and easier to understand and apply. And, presiding officer, another aim of the bill is to make it easier for contracting parties to create and remove third party rights. The abolition of irrevocability is welcomed by the Law Society of Scotland and by the Faculty of Advocates. And the abolition of this rule will also ensure that protections and balances are required for third parties entering into contracts. And, presiding officer, Scottish label the Scottish Labour will be supporting the bill because we want to see a legal system that guarantees certainty while providing flexibility and fairness for all parties. And where things go wrong, we need the right to proper arbitration. And this bill can deliver these outcomes and is an important step forward. And we are happy to support the contract third party rights Scotland bill and the motion in the Minister's name at decision time tonight. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst, around five minutes, please. Let me begin by echoing the comments of my colleague Graham Simpson and his thanks to our colleague John Scott, the, uh, who was the convener of the DPLR committee when this bill was introduced to Parliament. Uh, for his sterling work on this bill and in that committee, he did not shy away from dealing with issues of detail in their occasional horror. Um, no doubt we are all agreed that simplification and clarification of the law is a good thing. As I commented in my previous speech on this bill, the case of Carmichael against Carmichael is a good example to illustrate the human importance of what we do in making law in this place. Law that can be for the good or the ill, even if it may appear to deal with mundane and technical issues. Now, I will not repeat for the sake of speaking the areas already mentioned by many others in which the bill will clarify and improve the law of Scotland. The current inflexibility of the irrevocability rule, enforceability of third party rights in relation to damages and so on. So, is this a due to use quasitum tertio, as we lawyers pronounce it? Um, no disrespect to my colleague, Graham Simpson. That third party right spoken of by Lord Stair in his institutions, and I'm referring to the second edition published 1693 at 1105, in which he referred to it as quadrating to our customs. I hasten to add by reference to my register of interests as a practicing advocate that Stair is no longer the daily resort of a Scottish court practitioner. Nor is the case that Lord Stair referred to Ochmauti against the Laird of Maine which was decided on the 25th of November, 1609, and recorded in Morrison's Dictionary at 12126. Indeed, we would not expect it to be. It related to an action of spoolie of teens and the circumduction, sorry, uh, a very ancient term, this, the circumduction of the term, which, for example, was no longer applied in, and I quote, the modern form of procedure, according to the seventh edition of Bell's Dictionary of the Law of Scotland, published in 1890. But there is a serious point here. Unless an act, even an act of this parliament, is entirely clear, the courts can be thrown back on historic terms and case law. I made certain comments at the time of the last debate, including on the originally proposed section 10.1, which relates to renunciation, or would have related to renunciation by the third party. It does not, however, appear to have made its way back into the bill. 
In the policy memorandum to the bill as originally introduced, it was stated the principal policy aim of the bill was, and I quote, to replace the current common law. The financial memorandum referred to abolition of the use quite zetum tertio rule. But in the explanatory notes, reference was made to the importance of having a clear method of rejecting the third party right if desired, hence the draft section 10.1. In her letter dated 24th May 2017 to the DPLR committee, the cabinet minister said that the Scottish government had come to the view that section 10.1 as drafted was superfluous, saying it is simply a statement of what is already a matter of general principle. Presumably, that is a general principle of the common law. And this raises at least a question mark over the operation of the act. And question marks lead back to stare och mauti Bell and the Laird of Maine. Therefore, in closing, I ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary, and this notwithstanding Section 12 of the Bill. Does the Bill we are passing into law today, in her view, A, merely modify the use quasitum tertio rule, B, completely abolish the rule, or C, codify the rule to make it purely statutory within the act to be of this parliament, in other words, the bill that we are voting on today. Because if there's no clear answer to this question, it could be goodbye, hello, to use quasitum tertio. <laughs> it's very difficult for a presiding officer who has to know whether words are appropriate. <laughs> Can I call on the Minister um, to respond to the debate, please? Can you take us up to about half past four, please, Ms Ewing? Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and um, what would I say? I think we're, we're, we're verging on this side of the chamber the, to the view that it's goodbye, uh, use quasi from tertial going forwards. Uh, but I'd be happy, of course, to, to write in detail to the detailed point raised by the member. Um, I would thank all members who have spoken in the debate today for their contributions and indeed their interest in this piece of legislation. It has demonstrated, I think, the importance of the bill and modernising our law and third party rights, because as we've seen, we have been wending our way from jurisprudence uh, dating back to the 16th century through various centuries in between to bring us up to, to speed to the 21st century. And I think therefore that in itself demonstrates the need for a fresh look at this. Uh, Graham Simpson, who I also would like to, to welcome to his new role as convener of the DPLRC, uh, he, he recognised that though perhaps not the most exciting of bills that this parliament has had the opportunity to scrutinise, nonetheless, the bill was uh, important as it does set forth important rights for our constituents. And that is where we should always come back to when we are debating matters in this uh, uh, chamber. Presiding officer, I do welcome the support that has been expressed for the reforms uh, uh, from the outset. And I am grateful for the time that members have taken to engage with what is quite a discreet and specialist area of contract law and indeed for the constructive way in which they have approached the scrutiny uh, of the bill. I very much welcome the careful consideration that has been given. The bill has undoubtedly benefited from a willingness among stakeholders to participate fully in the development of the legislation. There has been little, uh, uh, if indeed any, disagreement about the need for these reforms, and the process, I think, rather has been more about ensuring that the provisions meet the aims of the reforms. I would like to take the opportunity to again thank the committee for its support, supportive and helpful stage one report, which indeed enabled us to focus clearly on a few issues which might have benefited from further consideration. We took the views of the committee on board, we spoke further with key stakeholders, and at stage two, we were therefore able to bring forward uh, a few amendments uh, which have ensured that the bill is clear and usable uh, and that a small gap in its application was indeed Plugged. We are confident that the amendments that we made to the bill at stage two have further improved uh, the bill uh, and that indeed therefore was a very useful process and again all credit to the hardworking and diligent members of Mr Simpson's new uh, committee. Um, I am presiding officer of the firm view that any opportunity to enter into an informed discussion with stakeholders about various issues enhances policy uh, considerations. And I would say in response to the specific uh, question that Claire Baker raised, uh, that we did indeed address some of the issues raised by the Faculty of Advocates, in particular with regards to arbitration. And I would also like to say, of course, that my door uh, is always open to the faculty should they wish to pursue any of these particular issues uh, uh, further. The ability to create third party rights is indeed important. 
There are many reasons for third party rights to be created and these apply, as we have heard, to individuals as much as to business. They provide vital entitlements and protections for individuals and businesses. Contracting parties to a contract and those who are provided with third party rights in a contract should all benefit from the law being clearer, up to date and indeed more flexible. For we all deserve a legal framework which is fit for purpose and this bill will deliver that. I would like to turn in the, the few minutes I have left, presiding officer, to deal with a couple of, of themes that have been recurring uh, during the legislative passage of this bill, and indeed uh, were uh, uh, referred to this afternoon. And a key issue, of course, is we have now hopefully about to pass this legislation. What happens next? How do we encourage recourse to this legislation? And what I would say is that reform of this kind often turns out to have a momentum of its own. I know that Professor uh, McQueen has spoken personally at various contract law conferences about the bill and that method of spreading the word will, I am sure, continue. Both Jonathan Gaskell and Craig Connell during the legislative passage of the bill also spoke about the role that the profession and practitioners have in raising the profile of the legislation. I am confident that there are strong advocates for the bill out there amongst the profession. Uh, there already have been numerous positive articles written and published about the legislation and all of that will continue uh, as well. David Wedderburn of the Royal Incorporation of Architects spoke about getting in at the ground level and indeed indicated that the Royal Incorporation of Architects would be issuing uh, practice notes to members alerting them to when the bill becomes an act. All of these actions will help to ensure that the relevant people are aware of the change in the law and indeed what it could mean for them. Once people start to use the provisions in the bill, that too should instill confidence that the law is now fit uh, for purpose. And of course, the Scottish Government stands ready to, to do what we can uh, to, to help this process uh, along. I am optimistic, Presiding Officer, that given the clear benefits of the bill in terms of the saving of time and money and the, 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 uh, the fact that no longer will people need to look to workarounds such as applying uh, the law of England, which is more costly for contracts here in Scotland, or indeed uh, using collateral warranties, that these workarounds uh, will no longer be necessary so we can save time and money uh, and I'm optimistic therefore that that will be a great incentive uh, to uh, the legal profession in terms of uh, properly advising their clients. Analogy with the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Act 2015 perhaps is apposite here. Prior to that legislation, again a DPLRC bill, prior to that legislation being uh, uh, passed by this parliament, the inability of documents to be ex executed in counterpart actually well, it meant that Scots law was less attractive uh, in the commercial world, world. However, we have received some qualitative anecdotal feedback which supports the view that the 2015 Act has had in, indeed a positive impact in this regard. It has generated efficiencies and for some has made the decision to, to use Scots law easier. Uh, so we see no reason why the third party rights bill would not perhaps have a similar effect in terms of improving and encouraging uh, the use of Scots law to create uh, third party rights. Uh, in responding to a point that uh, my colleague Stuart McMillan raised, and I know he raised it in committee, um, about uh, having discussions with Lord Pentland about how they approach uh, looking at their reform process, I am to meet with Lord Pentland, I believe, in the next few weeks, and I will, of course, be happy uh, uh, to raise that point uh, directly with Lord Pentland. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I believe that this bill is a worthy one for this Parliament's consideration tonight. It will bring much needed uh, reform, it will help individuals and businesses and it will make the law of Scotland uh, modern and bring us from where we have been earlier today which was the 16th century right up to the 21st century. So I would thank once again members across the chamber uh, for their stated uh, support during this uh, stage three debate and I uh, invite them to pass the uh, bill tonight at stage three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes our stage three debate on the contract third party rights Scotland bill. So we come to decision time and there are two questions today. The first question is that motion 7584 in the name of Tom Arthur on the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Our next question, just to remind members, next question is a stage three, so I will ask, we will hold a division, even if it's unanimous. So the final question is that motion 
7774 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the contract third party rights Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed. And if members would cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 7774 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 109, there were uh, no, zero, there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the contract third party rights Scotland Bill is passed. And that concludes decision time.